Hi animal loving friends. Today we'll be going over a difficult topic. As you can guess from the title of this video, we'll be discussing DM, also known as degenerative myelopathy. We will also briefly touch on a similar disease called IVDD or invertebral disc disease. I'll be doing my best to provide a full overview of these topics and associated issues. Before we begin, a quick disclaimer, I am not a veterinarian or a veterinary expert. However, I am a dog dad who's heavily involved in the dog rescue world. Everything I present in this video is based on my own research and my own opinion on the topic, I'm trying to share just a little bit of my own opinion and educate a little bit more about what DM actually is. So that's gonna be the focus of what we're gonna talk about. But this is all based on trying to protect my own dogs. Please feel free to pursue additional reading on this topic. In fact, I really encourage you to look up some of the sources that we've included in the description of this video, just so that you can get a better understanding of what I'm talking about if you have some more questions. As I said, I linked multiple articles and supporting information in the description of this video. Degenerative myelopathy, or commonly known as DM, is a disease that affects the spinal cord of dogs, causing progressive deterioration of the muscles and a loss of coordination. Generally, DM manifests with symptoms, including but not limited to, difficulty getting up and walking, hind leg weakness, incoordination, urinary or fecal incontinence, and eventual paralysis of the dog's front or rear legs. Typically, DM manifests between the ages of 8 and 14 years old, but there have been cases where the disease manifests sooner. There is no cure for DM, and it is considered terminal usually within two years of symptoms manifesting. This is due to several contributing factors beyond the leg paralysis, which includes reduced ability to properly breathe due to increasing paralysis throughout the body. It is possible to extend the life of a dog with DM, thus progressing past the two-year time frame and into a more advanced stage of the disease by providing constant care and mobility tools to a canine wheelchair. Thankfully, DM is not painful for the dog because of the gradual deterioration of the muscles and nerves in the spinal cord. It is very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS in humans. DM can only be diagnosed officially after a dog has passed on because it requires a microscopic evaluation of the dog's spinal cord. This means an autopsy needs to be performed on the dog after the dog has passed. In addition, there are other diseases like IVDD, invertebral disc disease, that have very similar symptoms. However, unlike DM, IVDD is treatable with surgery, therapy, and steroids. Our dog Mocha suffered from IVDD, and thankfully she has recovered from a spinal injury with rest, steroids, and physical therapy. This happened a few years ago now, so she's doing really well and we've had no issues with her. So why are we so concerned about DM now? Well, that's because of this living bread loaf, our foster Finn. If you don't know from our previous videos about Finn, we've done a whole series on him so far because we think he's his case is very interesting. He comes from a very prestigious breeder who's influenced the Pembroke Welsh Corgi breed in the US for the last 50 years. We know a few dogs that she has bred over the years and they are all seemingly very healthy and amazing looking dogs. Now, we are a rescue family. Our dogs came from all over the country, from owner surrenders to strays to puppy mills. Editing note, our other current Pembroke Welsh Corgi eggnog was surrendered by a puppy mill after being chained up for the first two years of his life and used as a breeder dog. He was dumped after he was no longer producing puppies, and we helped bring him to the rescue. Just to clarify, we did not buy a dog from a puppy mill. We have never had a dog from a reputable breeder, so we thought we should test Finn's genetics and see what information we could get from that. As it turns out, Finn has two markers for both IVDD and DM, which means that genetically he is at a high risk for both diseases. So here's a quick science lesson to explain what I mean when I say he's at a high risk for both of these. There's two types of genes which you may or may not be familiar with. There's 
dominant genes, which means that a trait will always manifest, or there are recessive genes, which means you need two copies of that gene for the trait to manifest. Blue eyes, like I have, for example, is a recessive gene. And they're only possible because I have two copies of the gene from my parents, one copy from each of them. The gene marker for DM is recessive, which means that every dog that has DM has two copies of that defective gene. As we said, Finn has two copies of the DM gene and the IVDD gene, which puts him at high risk for two very difficult to manage spinal issues. As you can see from these examples that we've collected from a bunch of other owners that are currently dealing with or previously dealing with DM with their own dogs, and these are all suspected cases because as we said before, DM can't be directly diagnosed until after the dog has died but they're fairly confident that it is DM because other possibilities have been eliminated. DM is very difficult for the dogs and their owners to deal with and manage. It requires a lot of extra care, time, and patience to manage a DM dog's needs. For example, dogs with DM have trouble going to the bathroom on their own, especially in the later stages of the disease. They will need assistance from their owners to express their bowels and their bladder. So then, it's an open and shut case. Right? Read or bad, story over, thank you for coming to my TED talk. Well, not exactly. It'd be very easy for me to say, DM is bad. Let's force all breeders to check for DM and eliminate it from the gene pool. Here's where it gets much more complicated. Every dog that has DM has two copies of the defective DM gene. However, not every dog that has two copies of the gene develops DM. So how does that work? What does that mean now? In a simplified form, and there are a lot more studies if you want to read further about it, but basically, most genetic diseases are not linked to one specific gene marker. That means that in the case of DM, dogs that develop the disease have other deficiencies besides the gene that causes them to manifest DM. There are several unknown factors that influence whether or not a dog will eventually get DM. Many breeders claim that good body structure is key to breeding dogs that don't get DM. Breeders also claim that if you removed every dog with the DM gene from the gene pool, that there would not be enough dogs left to breed certain breeds in a healthy way. Pembroke Welsh Corgis fall into this category because DM is a very old mutation and over half the dogs in the Corgi gene pool test as at risk for DM. Plus, since we barely understand how DM manifests, breeding to eliminate DM from the Pembroke Welsh Corgi breed or other breeds could result in unforeseen health issues. Based on current studies, only 1% of Pembroke Welsh Corgis with the two DM genes will actually develop DM. So, what now? One proposed solution is to breed clear, as in breed with Corgis that do not have the DM gene. However, this only accounts for around 12% of the current Pembroke Walsh Corgi gene pool that's available for breeding, which as you can probably guess, would create a huge inbreeding problem, much bigger than what currently exists. And that's kind of a topic for another day if anyone's interested. Generally, it's frowned upon to breed within a close familial relationship. Just like with people, there's a higher risk of genetic mutation when you breed a brother and sister together or even two cousins, for example. It may not cause issues immediately, but if historical monarchies are a good example, it can eventually lead to frail and sickly offspring in later generations. Plus, the Pembroke Walsh Corgi and other breeds may lose other beneficial genes that help keep the dogs that we love healthy by limiting the gene pool to such a degree. So what should prospective Corgi owners look for? You, as a prospective Corgi owner, or a current Corgi owner, should look for the best possible record of health from the your breeder. That means if a breeder does not provide extensive familial history for your dog, guaranteeing that there are no cases of DM or other diseases in the family tree going back several generations of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and even great-great-grandparents who might be trying to hide bad breeding practices from you. For example, Finn has records going all the way back to his great-great-grandparents. You should also be wary of a breeder that provides only DM clear or DM carrier genetic title or test. 
because that on its own is not proof that the dog is going to be healthy later down the line. Prospective pet parents really need to be upfront when asking about the previous generations of dogs and their health so that you have more confidence that the puppy that you're getting is going to be healthy as they grow up. My final opinion on this is that prospective owners need to be more aware of what they are buying when they go to a breeder. There are several genetic tests which can be great tools to help demonstrate that a dog is genetically healthy. I think owners should start asking that more of these tests be performed with parent dogs and or puppies to show that the dogs are genetically healthy. This will help increase the likelihood that the dogs will be healthier over their entire lifespan. Dog parents should also demand to know their puppy's lineage so that they can know whether or not there is a family history of certain diseases. Just like with people, dogs are at a higher risk of developing diseases later in life if they have a direct link to someone in their family that has also gotten the disease. We can and should do more to help prevent dogs from developing DM. And instead of allowing dog breeders to claim that it's too difficult to try to eliminate this disease, we should all collectively push towards eliminating the possibility of these diseases. Maybe in the future that means corgis are only carriers of the DM gene, and we have to be very careful about breeding dogs to try and ensure that we have puppies that are at a higher risk of DM. But currently, even the 1% of dogs that do develop DM are too many dogs that are dealing with this disease. I hope this video was informative about DM. That being said, you're free to make your own decisions about it. We, my wife and I, have never bought dogs from a breeder, and we will continue to foster, rescue, and adopt dogs in the future. We volunteer, we transport, and we help rescue dogs all the time. That's what we're passionate about, and we'll continue to do so. That being said, we don't frown upon anyone that wants to buy a puppy. I do ask that if you're considering buying a puppy, that you hold your breeder to a higher standard. Ask the breeder what they are doing to avoid breeding dogs with the potential for DM. At minimum, dogs should be demonstrated to be from a lineage that is free of DM. New puppies should be born from parents that are healthy over their whole lives at a minimum standard. Ask if your breeder has done any genetic testing to try and avoid the potential of DM and other diseases. Finn here may never actually develop DM. And if he doesn't, we can celebrate and breathe a sigh of relief. If he does, we'll take care of him. At the end of the day, we know too many pet parents and furry babies that have to suffer through this disease. We can and should be doing more to eliminate the disease so that no dog has to suffer through it. If you like this deeper dive, into dog breeding from a rescue perspective and want to see more discussions like this, let us know in the comments. If you need some idea of bad dog breeding practices, you can look at some of our other rescue videos about double moral dogs or other dogs that have been abused by their breeders, linked above and below this video. There are actually some other gen interesting genetic comparisons we could make between our own dogs now that we have all their DNA results. So if there's any interest in that, please let us know. Thank you for watching and listening. Please remember to spay and neuter your pets and please be kind to animals.